Good morning and welcome to our Boxing Day service. I pray that you enjoyed a good Christmas and were able to spend time with family and friends or that you're looking forward to that in the next few weeks. I know that I am. For those of us joining this morning on their own, I pray that you would have a sense of togetherness as we are bound together by the Spirit. Wherever you are, perhaps you might consider lighting a candle as we have lit our Advent ring. Today we'll be finding out about St Stephen, thanks to John Ritchie and Eva Will, as well as thinking about what it means to receive the perfect gift. To begin with, join in singing our opening hymn, See Amid the Winter's Snow. See amid the winter's snow Born for us on earth below See the gentle lamb appears Promised from eternal years Hail that ever-blessed morn Hail redemption's happy dawn Sing through all Jerusalem Christ is born in continue our worship now in prayer. Let us pray. God of all things, we praise you as the all, in all, through all, and with all. We come to you in worship. Help us to bring our all, the good, the difficult, the broken, the weariness, the indifference, the passion, the hope and hopelessness, the joy, the anger, the reality of our lives. We have waited through Advent, through dark days and expectant nights. We have declared your presence at Christmas in the highs and lows, the joys and pains. We look to you now as we gather together to clothe us and to dwell in our hearts. 
Grow in us the desire to be your kingdom builders, peacemakers, psalm singers, justice bringers, creation carers, welcomers and forgivers. Let us praise your name in harmony with the angels and the hosts, sun and moon, mountains and hills, trees and animals. Let all the people praise you for you alone are exalted. Loving God, we remember that from the very start, the good news of Jesus was not just for a select few, but for all. You were born and grew and lived on this earth, helped us in the heights and depths of our lives to not only look and see for you, but to recognize you in our midst. Help us to look into the difficult places of our lives and to know you present with us. Help us to recognize you in all people, welcoming, including, and caring for all. Help us to think and act beyond ourselves. In our praying and singing, speaking and listening, giving and receiving, may you be honored and glorified and all people be dignified and acknowledged as yours. Join our voices together in an unending hymn of praise to you and hear us now as we pray together in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first Bible reading today is read to us by Joyce Pinnell. It's from Matthew's Gospel. And after that, we're going to hear from Callum, our children and families worker. The reading is taken from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. The birth of Jesus Christ. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Amen. Hi everyone. I hope you had a fantastic day yesterday and that your tree, like the one next to me here, was overflowing with gifts of things that you wanted and surprises and things that you never knew were coming your way. I wonder what your favourite gift was. Now, there's one thing I've learned over my years of receiving and giving gifts, is that no matter how much you enjoy receiving them, they just don't last forever. If you've got nice new clothes, eventually you'll wear through the needs, or they'll go out of style, or no new kids, outgrow them fairly quickly. Even if you got a really, really fun new toy, well, it could break. You might grow tired of it. It might roll under the sofa and be forgotten about. Now, did you get a load of chocolate and sweets in your stocking? I certainly did. And, well, unfortunately, this bag that was once full of them now is empty. No sweets left for me. Well, there is one Christmas gift that is a little bit different from all these ones, different from clothes, different from sweets, different from games and toys. It never goes out of style. You'll never be able to grow out of it. And 
it's the true gift that Christmas is all about. It's a gift given by God himself. Now, have you figured out what that gift might be? It is, of course, Jesus, his own son. Now, the Bible tells us that all who receive the gift of Jesus and believe in his name will become the children of God. And when we become the children of God, we get all the rights and privileges of being his child. What does that mean? Well, it means God will love us. It means God will protect us and provide us with everything that we need. And the best part of it is that it never ends. The love never runs out. The gift never runs out. The bag is never empty. In Psalm 23 verse 6, the Bible tells us that kindness and love will be with us every day. And we will live forever in the house of God. Now, I enjoy giving and receiving gifts at Christmas. But it's important to remember the greatest gift of all is God's gift to us. It's the gift that literally keeps on giving. Now, we want to say a little prayer just before we hang back and say, Dear God, we thank you for loving us so much that you gave your son so we too can become your children. In Jesus' name, amen. And enjoy the rest of your Boxing Day.
We're going to listen now for our second reading from Luke's Gospel, after which there's going to be a feast for your eyes, and then I invite you to join in with Good King Wenceslas. John and Eva are then going to help us to get to know St Stephen a little bit better. Our reading comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Amen.
us on a happy feast of St Stephen, John. And to you, Eva. When the Reverend Stella was looking for volunteers to take part in the Boxing Day service, I hadn't given much thought to the celebration of the Feast of St Stephen, except when singing Good King Wenceslas. To celebrate someone who was stoned to death is not really in keeping with the babe lying in the manger. To me, it's more in keeping with Easter. I don't know. Perhaps there are some reasons to include the first, the feast of the first Christian martyr at this time. So what did you find out about the life of Stephen? Our Bible readings tell us that Stephen was an Hellenistic Jew, which means that he spoke Greek and probably came from Asia Minor, which is part of modern day Turkey. Tradition suggests that Stephen knew Jesus and was possibly one of the 72 disciples mentioned in Luke chapter 10. Two years after Jesus' death and resurrection, Acts chapter 6 tells us that the apostles decided to ordain seven deacons to supervise the care of the Greek-speaking widows who were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. One of the seven was Stephen, who was described as a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit. He worked many miracles and proclaimed the gospel in the synagogues with inspired wisdom. Yes, but Stephen's popularity created enemies among some of the local Jews, especially members of the synagogue, and especially a teacher called Saul. They debated with Stephen, looking for evidence to use against him to further their hatred and their persecution of the early church but they couldn't stand up against the wisdom that the Spirit gave to Stephen when he spoke. So they, pers they persuaded some men to accuse him of blasphemy, of speaking against God and Moses. The charges angered the local elders and the teachers of the law, who demanded that he be tried and punished. When Stephen was put on trial, several false witnesses were brought before the Sanhedrin to testify that he was guilty of blasphemy. He was charged with predicting that Jesus would destroy the temple and for preaching against the laws of Moses. I particularly like verse 15. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Exodus chapter 34 tells us that after Moses spent time with God, his face shone with such a radiant glow that the people were afraid to come near him. The Sanhedrin should have remembered Moses' shining face. It was as if God was saying about Stephen that this man is no blasphemer. He is like my servant Moses. Having the face of an angel, Stephen, like Moses, was a witness to and a reflection of God's glory. Yeah, I like that imagery too. Stephen was filled with wisdom from heaven. He responded to his accusers by detailing the history of Israel and, the, and outlining the blessings God had bestowed upon his chosen people. He also explained how disobedient Israel had become, despite the goodness and mercy of the Lord. Stephen explained that Jesus had come to fulfil the law of Moses, not to destroy it. He quoted extensively from the scriptures to prove his case. Finally, he rebuked the Sanhedrin, calling them stiff-necked and just like their ancestors, always resisting the Holy Spirit. They received the law through the angels, but they chose not to obey it. As Stephen concluded his defence, he looked up and saw a vision. Look, he said. I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. The vision was taken as the final proof of blasphemy by the Jews, who did not believe Jesus was the Messiah or the Son of God. The crowd rushed upon Stephen and carried him outside of the city to stone him to death. As Stephen was being brutally stoned, he spoke his last words. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord, don't hold the sin against them. Words which echoed the very words of Jesus on the cross. Following those words, Stephen died. 
So, what reasons are there to place the Feast of St. Stephen immediately after Christmas Day? Well, at first glance, to join the memory of Stephen, the first martyr, and the birth of our Saviour might seem a bit surprising because of the contrast between the peace and joy of Bethlehem and the tragedy of Stephen stoned in Jerusalem during the first persecution of the young church. However, there are some obvious similarities between the two. Both were filled with the Holy Spirit, worked miracles, proclaimed the good news, brought glory to God, and were wrongly accused of blasphemy, tried by the Sanhedrin, and put to death after forgiving their accusers. So it is appropriate that the fe Feast of Stephen is given pride of place after Christmas Day. Stephen does also remind us that God's gift to us, born in a stable, Christ the Lord, requires everything from us. We must be ready and willing to give our lives to him completely and without reserve. Stephen's life and death shows that we must give him, who was born an infant in Bethlehem, everything, holding nothing back, even if it means persecution and death. This could appear to strip away our Christmas joy. It could put a dampener on this festive season. But Stephen's story is, first and foremost, one of witnessing to our Saviour. Throughout Advent, the angels witnessed the coming of the Emmanuel, culminating in the heavenly host proclaiming and praising God in the skies above the hillside near Bethlehem. The role of witnesses passed to the shepherds, who went into Bethlehem glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen. The disciples and the apostles bore witness to the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And throughout the centuries, countless thousands of unknown faithful followers have witnessed to Jesus, sacrificing everything for him. So today, the Feast of Stephen, we should remember what he and all the witnesses willingly gave up for their newborn king and join the angels and the shepherds in praising God with joy for his precious gift to us, his son, Emmanuel, Christ the Lord.
with your present purchases this year. And what about the presents you received? Was your face full of wonder as you tore in? I wonder what makes a perfect gift. Is it the presentation? You know, those gifts that are so well wrapped, it takes a little while to wrestle with the paper and the bow and the gift tag. Is it getting what you asked for or perhaps what you hinted at on your Amazon wish list? Is it getting something you didn't expect, but which turns out to be incredible? Like a book you would never have thought to buy, or tickets for a show you would never have gone to, or a gadget for the home that really does save time and energy? Or is it getting something that you need? You know, the practical gifts, like socks. Is it being surprised when somebody gets you something that you really love and you just didn't realise that they knew that about you? Research indicates that we're not great at giving perfect Christmas presents. Wealthify estimates that something like £733 million are spent in the year on unwanted Christmas presents for children. But the good news is that God is a much better gift giver than we will ever be. So no matter whether you were ecstatic with your gifts or whether today you're searching for the gift receipt, thinking about how you're going to change it later in this week. Today we're thinking about getting the most perfect Christmas present we could ever get. Joseph features in the reading from Matthew's Gospel. He's given a specific and significant and precious task, that of naming Jesus. For him to name the baby was to claim Jesus as his own. Joseph is Jesus's earthly father. And we see him in this passage being drawn into caring for and protecting both Mary and their son. But he's also in this passage given this most wonderful insight into the gift that Jesus is to him, to Mary and to all those who will unwrap him. Jesus was a very popular name in Israel at the time, a bit like Liam or Oliver in the UK. Lots of little boys in Nazareth running around with that name. It was drawn from the name Joshua, the great battle leader of the Old Testament. And in Hebrew, it was a pun on the phrase, God saves. God had indeed saved his people with Joshua at the helm, leading them across the River Jordan and defeating the Canaanites to take the promised land, their home. And as families named their sons Jesus, they longed for the day God would rescue them again from their enemies and give them back their land. But Jesus was going to do far more than save his people from the Romans. He was going to save his people from their sins, the very thing that severed the connection with the God who had called them into being in the first place. Jesus may have been a common name, but this was no ordinary baby. And this boy born in an extraordinary, mysterious way was a gift to his people like they had never had before. I love how Matthew simply records that Joseph obeys the angel's instructions. And when the baby is born, he names him Jesus. The faithfulness of a quiet, honourable man whose heart was now filled with the good news of who Jesus is. But it's not just Joseph to whom this good news is revealed. Outside Bethlehem, there's a group of shepherds who are diligently looking after their sheep. And to them, the angel says, today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. 
He is the Messiah, the Lord. A saviour has been born to you. A gift has been given. But just what kind of saviour? How, how is Jesus going to save his people from their sins? What, what does it mean to say that Jesus is the perfect gift? For us, the words saviour and good news are automatically associated with Jesus because we've grown up with this story. But at the time, they were connected with someone else, someone political. Luke opens the nativity scene by reminding us who was in charge. Caesar Augustus is emperor. This is actually of a statue of his uncle, Julius Caesar. But Caesar Augustus was known by the people to be a saviour. He was apparently good news, having brought peace to the known world through the Pax Romana. But for the people of God and for the shepherds, a Roman emperor was not the saviour that they looked forward to, nor was he the saviour they needed. In fact, they were looking forward to someone who was going to rescue them from the emperor. If we begin to look a little closer, we get hints of what kind of saviour Jesus is going to be. The shepherds were outcasts because of their job. They may have had small holdings, but even with that, it was now on impossible to make enough money with taxes to look after their families. So they would hire themselves out to look after sheep belonging to other people. Jesus talks in John 10 about the hirelings who run away. They don't have a good reputation. Some were known for taking that which did not belong to them. And their job meant that they were perpetually, ceremoniously unclean. As such, they were looked down on by the religious leaders. They were not allowed to testify in legal proceedings according to rabbinic teaching. Their word was not to be trusted. How ironic, given the elevated position shepherds have in scripture. First Moses, then King David, then the Lord himself. And even more ironically, these shepherds on these particular hills were most likely responsible for the flocks that were used for sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem. The sheep and lambs they looked after were used to cleanse the sins of the people who despised and rejected them, to atone for the sins of those who said that they should stay away from the temple. How perfect of God to send the message to a group of shepherds tending the sacrificial lambs that a saviour had been born. Because what kind of saviour would Jesus be? He would be a sacrificial one, a shepherd who would lay down his life for his sheep. Remember at John's Gospel, when it said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is a perfect gift because he is a perfect sacrifice without blemish or stain, the one whose death will put an end to all sacrifices. A perfect gift born to the shepherds who never got much from religious folk except grief. But I want to go back just for a moment to the packaging that this particular gift comes in, so to speak. The wrapping around the message from the angel to the shepherds. Have you ever noticed it? I mean, have you ever looked properly at the words in Luke's gospel that are so familiar to us? Yes, suddenly the angel appears and the shepherds were so afraid. It literally says they were afraid with a great fear. But sandwiched in between are these words. The glory of the Lord shone around them. The glory of the Lord shone around them. That's not simply angelic radiance. That's a manifestation of the presence of the one and only living God on a hillside in Bethlehem. The last time God's glory shone was in the temple, centuries upon centuries ago. It was astonishing and overwhelming and those who were conducting worship had to get out of the way because it was too much for them to handle. God's glory is immense. It's associated with light and weight and splendor, majesty and beauty. And it was dangerous. You couldn't get too close to it because it was holy. Think of Moses at the burning bush when he's told not to come any closer but to take off his shoes because he's on holy ground. But here, on a hillside in Bethlehem, in the midst of a group of outcasts, the glory of the Lord not only appears, but it shines all around them. They are engulfed with the glory of the Lord. 
No wonder they were feared. On the night Jesus was born, God's glory blew up the hillside outside Bethlehem. God came closer in his revealed glory to his people than he had been for thousands of years. What kind of saviour? The kind that enables us to get close to God. The kind that brings God to us. Emmanuel. Sin is what gets in the way. Sin is the gap that needs closed, the stain that needs removed, the circuit breaker, if you like. Sin is what separates us from God because he is full of glory and because he is holy. And yet he loves us and he, he desires to be reconciled to us, to bring us closer. That's the goal, to close the gap. He wants to dwell with us, that we would be his people. And for a moment on a hillside, the shepherds got to do that because Jesus, their saviour, had been born. God's salvation plan was unfolding and nothing was going to stop it. Jesus is a perfect gift for the shepherds because their whole lives were all about enabling people to get closer to God. And now through Jesus's birth, they experience a nearness to God that very few people had ever encountered. The glory of the Lord shone around them and they were told not to be afraid because a saviour had been born to them. This is good news. This is good news of great joy. This is good news of great joy for all people because this perfect gift of salvation, this perfect sacrifice was not simply for the shepherds or the Jewish people, but for us too. The letter to the Hebrews puts it like this. Day after day, every peace priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, meaning Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Whatever else you unwrap this Christmas time, however you feel about the gifts that you have received or given, don't forget to, wrap the most, to unwrap the most important gift of all, the most perfect gift of all. Instead, be like the shepherds who immediately went to find the gift. And when they did, they returned, glorifying and praising God. Amen. Ibadan is going to lead us now in our prayers for others. Let us pray. Our Father, we give thanks that you have brought us this far in the year 2021, a year like no other. We acknowledge your faithfulness in our lives, our families, and our community. We give thanks because you have been our help and our keeper. You have been our shelter from the various storms that have come our way. You were with us through thick and thin. You sustained us when we felt that we could not continue. God, it's been a hard year. Many things have gone on which we would not have wanted if we had the choice. There has been lots to trip us up. The unending pandemic, economic meltdown, social isolation, aspects of injustice on so many and the ongoing call for one solution or the other. We have also experienced natural disasters in many parts of the world, including ours, destructive storm, hurricanes, earthquakes, forest fires, and many others. Thank you, Lord, for the joy of today, having seen us through them all, 
and giving us the opportunity to celebrate another Christmas. We thank you for the strength you have given us through loss and bereavement. Many within our families, church family and community. Hear our prayers for those who are grieving, those who have buried their loved ones without the comfort of funerals or the physical presence of family and friends. Even for those who had friends and family around them, there is the pain of loss and separation. We ask that your presence and peace may sustain them through the first year and many years without their loved ones. We give thanks because we can say of a truth that if you had not been on our side, we would not have made it through. We pray for medical professionals and staff who work so faithfully in hospitals, clinics and nursing homes. Please give them strength, courage, protect them and those around them. Thank you for scientists who diligently work at producing the vaccine that we need to fight the pandemic. Grant them increased wisdom and bless the work of their hands. We pray for those who lost their job during the year, for your provision and blessing upon them. We commit business owners to you in this time of financial insecurity. Help them survive and navigate their way through the challenges of the virus and others that they face. We pray for the homeless, refugees and people in war-torn countries. And now, Lord, we bring our world to you. We had thought that by this time we would have come out of this pandemic fully. But it seems as if the end is not yet in sight. Lord, as our leaders struggle with and seek to make sense of all that we are going through as a nation and people, please order and direct their deliberations, the decisions they make, and the eventual implementation of such decisions. We plead all-knowing and excellent God, that you would keep watch over us as we navigate the unfamiliar and disturbing trend. We pray concerning the festive period. We have had Christmas and the new year is round the corner. We pray that we would not pick the virus and that it would not be transmitted to others. There are also other health challenges requiring attention. We pray that people would be able to access the care they desperately need. We pray that they will receive the necessary treatment before their situation worsens. Much more, Lord, you are our healer. As we thank you for our lives and situations, we pray for the hearts to be available to assist those who are struggling around us, that we can continue to care for one another. We pray for those fleeing from their countries and communities, that we would offer whatever help you enable us to give. Help us to have compassion for those who are less privileged, those who are oppressed and lonely. Protect those who are persecuted for their faith, those who cannot worship freely as we do. Bless our families, our church family and our community. Bless our lives and our weak Lord as we pray in the name of our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen and Amen. 
Thank you to Ebedin for that prayer and indeed to everyone who's been involved in today's service and to Callum who helped with the recording uh, for today. Uh, if you want to know more about what's happening in the coming weeks, please check out the details uh, in the newsletter, especially regarding pastoral cover. We're going to join together in singing our closing praise, Good Christians All Rejoice. service draws to a close now, I invite you to join with me in our closing blessing. Let's all go now with the excitement of the shepherds, the perseverance of the wise men, the transforming acceptance of Joseph, the insight of Mary, and the joy of Jesus, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest with you through this Christmas season into 2022 and forevermore. Amen. Merry Christmas and have a very happy new year when it comes. <laughs>